Hello, sir. Okay. You ready? No. So we're going to stand up here and look pretty? All right. All right, cool. Woo. So thanks, everybody, for coming for the talk. Um, obviously, Kevin Minnick and myself uh, wanted to get together and uh, get a talk around adaptive penetration testing, which uh, we'll be explaining a little bit here. Well, um, my new book, Ghost in the Wires, uh, has just been released, and it's kind of, kind of adaptive pen testing. A lot of that in the book, albeit without authorization. So um, taking kind of those concepts and using uh, kind of the same stuff today. Some of the same stuff still works, but we'll get into that later. I have a company that we do security assessments, um, and, but we, we take usually security assessments that are, are full compromise. You know, we kind of pick and choose, so it's kind of fun. Actually, the only, the only work for pen testing, the only work involved is actually writing the report. That's the only boring part. But the, the, the actual work of pen testing is the awesome part. And I'm learning, uh, Dave's teaching me a little bit about social engineering. He wrote this kind of little uh, <laughs> toolkit. So D Dave has taken me under his wing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a I have to say, Kevin is the number one bug contributor to the social engineer toolkit. So, I mean, he constantly uses it, and I get to, get to fix all the bugs that I do on my horrible coding. <laughs> About myself, I'm the creator of the Social Engineer Toolkit, one of the founders of DerbyCon. Uh, I have a book uh, uh, from No Starch Press that about 15 minutes after the um, talk here, I'll do some more book signings over the No Starch Press booth, which is right outside, uh, if anybody wants to, to purchase it, and I'll sign it, and I'll customize it, and give you a hug. Um, I'm on the Backtrack Development team, the Exploit DB team, although I've been kind of inactive on the Exploit DB team lately. It's Dookie's show. Uh, exploit writer, and I'm a chief information security officer at uh, Diebold. And I give hugs. So, I like hugs. Um, so a brief introduction about what we wanted to get out of uh, this um, talk right here is adaptive penetration testing. And when we look at penetration testing as a whole, it's becoming kind of a convoluted um, you know, system that we're leveraging because there's no standardization around penetration testing. And for us, what we wanted to do is, is show different scenarios that we leverage in real world penetration tests that are outside the norm. Things that you don't think of unless you're a hacker. Things that you try to do uh, that haven't been done before uh, that has, actually has a, a large impact on that organization. Uh, in a lot of penetration testing, I see that my, talk, my clients talk to me about is they, they hire a company, they do, they do scans, you know, they use the common, the common scanning tools, and then they package up like a 400 page report with their logo and send it over to the CSO for review. In other words, they're not, they're not, they're not actually looking for a lot, of, they're not looking over the whole cross, the whole, for the holistic vulnerabilities across the whole enterprise and being able to take several vulnerabilities that they've identified and put it together into something that's really useful. They kind of stop at identifying the single vulnerabilities, put them, in, put them into a report, send it over to the client, and it's not of much use. That's not every pen testing company that does it out there, but it's a lot, lot of them that I've encountered. Yep, and you know, we're trying to come to a point in the security community to where we can all come together and agree on a formal methodology around penetration testing that meets all of our, our, all of our needs. And it requires actually having some skill to do penetration testing. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't grow through a penetration test and become novice and, and grow up, but at the same time, we have to set some standards around um, actually performing penetration tests and defining it. And uh, that's why the penetration testing execution standard was developed, which there'll definitely be a panel uh, talking about that um, you know, after our presentation uh, on the penetration testing execution standard. But essentially, that standard um, is being released today. And it basically defines what a penetration test should be. And basically, everybody in the community came together all over the world, people from God knows where, to come together as penetration testers to say, listen, we've had enough. We want to define what this is. And this is what it's going to be moving forward. And so I, I look at, at the industry and I say, have we forgotten what we're trying to do during a penetration test? Our whole goal of a penetration test is to attack the organization and try to impact their ability to generate revenue or try to hit them where it actually hurts. You know, and that's what an actual attacker is going to do, right? They're going to go in, they're going to target an infrastructure, they're going to uh, you know, post um, intellectual property or steal it, um, ransoms, uh, try to go after financial systems, whatever their motives are. And really, that's where we kind of need to go when it comes to uh, penetration testing. And that's not where we're really at right now. Yeah, and I, I encourage you know, people that are doing pen penetration testing to kind of think out of the box. Again, as I mentioned before, a lot of it is canned, or they follow a, a simple checklist. And uh, they, you know, it does, they do some good work, but I, 
I like to think about thinking out of the box, taking, looking at the enterprise, looking at the target, and figuring any way you can compromise that target through compromising physical, technical, or, or, or human factor vulnerabilities. So I kind of put, when we're doing our pen testing, we, like, we look at everything holistically, and then we look how to attack the target. It's kind of cool because um, with my company, I hire pen, pen testing contractors. And so kind of depending on the scope of the, the scope, of the uh, job, then I'll hire a team, kind of like, kind of like a Mission Impossible team. Uh, that's uh, where each I of the- I didn't bring the music, sorry. Yeah, I don't have the music. But it's kind of like where the people involved are especially skilled at, attar uh, at attacking what that client particularly has exposed. So um, kind of that's how I set it up, and, and it's, it's been very successful. And obviously you have something wrong. I mean, we're seeing an elevated number of breaches that are occurring. Uh, this, these statistics are taken from privacyrights.org, but if you look at from 2008 to 2011, there's exponential growth on companies actually um, receiving breaches. And some may say, hey, we might be getting better at uh, detection elements. Well, generally speaking, and that was from Forrester, around 70% of them had been in breach for several months or years uh, without actually knowing that they were actually compromised. And so you think, you know, with the industry growing larger and larger and larger, uh, we would actually start to be able to stop some of these exposures and actually start to stop some of these attacks. However, what we're seeing is it's not really happening. And in fact, uh, I, I know some you know, old colleagues I used to work with, when they would compromise, uh, when they'd compromise a target, the, the, the target would, would not get them out for years. I mean, once you get in, it's extremely difficult for the, uh, to, get the, to get the attackers out of the network. I mean, depending on their sophistication. But, you know, I've, I've known guys that have been in for like a decade, so. Ouch. Yeah, a decade. And so we look at our spend as far as Gartner goes, and, and year after year we continue to increase our spend when it comes to security. We buy those shiny products, right? And, and while those products are great and they absolutely can assist in, in building your security program, you have to look at your foundation first and what that really is. So we spend more money on protecting our infrastructure and we buy the latest technologies to protect against the zero days, right? And yet, we still see these guys running amok, right? <laughs> yeah, and these guys, you know, didn't use super sophisticated exploits, right? Like the LulzSec team, I think some of used, you know, basic SQL injection, and then their uh, DDoS tools. Not super sophisticated. Anonymous, I think they uh, recently compromised BART's, one of BART's websites, again, through simple SQL injection. So it's not rocket science. So why, why, were, why were they effective? Because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. I mean, how and long has SQL yeah. injection been around for? 13 years? Yeah, years. And, and there's some in the industry that actually argue that pen testing is not valuable. I think like Marcus Ranum, you know, right. argues that pen testing is invaluable. And I don't agree with that. I think if these entities actually had tested their security ahead of time, uh, probably LulzSec or the anonymous crew wouldn't have got in, right? And I guess it all goes yeah, into so. what they actually do to protect themselves. If they get a report that actually shows systemic weaknesses in their infrastructure, and you're actually able to represent that you're actually able to take, take down the company and compromise them, and they don't fix it, well, that's on them. But at the same time, it, it's better of them to have that knowledge and actually fix them than not know it all. Well, it's interesting because uh, several companies have hired, uh, hired us to do security assessments, and we package up the report, we find their vulnerabilities, and then what happens is they hire us next year to do the same thing. So what do we do is we pull the old report, and you know what? 90% of the stuff isn't fixed because the only reason they're doing the security assessment is for compliance. They have to comply, whether it's SOX, GLBA, HIPAA, whatever. And so it's interesting because some companies don't seem to really care much about security, they would just really care about complying. And so this is how we build our security programs. <laughs> it's true, right? We don't wanna know because we're scared. We, we tuck our heads in the sand and we hide from it. And we fear these guys, I mean, Hey, but those guys actually were kind of cool because I actually got, because of their activities, I have three new clients. <laughs> so thank you, LoveSec. Thank you, Anonymous. Business is good. Yeah. <laughs> we're the only industry that I know of where we can keep increasing our budget, keep in increasing our expenditures, keep increasing our capital expenditures, and continue to get worse. And actually, that, uh, Justin Nephon, if he's in the audience here, he actually proved uh, that that's, that's not actually accurate. Weathermen are the first, and we were second. <laughs> so... So I guess we're the second industry that I know of um, that continues to get worse. So this brings us to our point. We believe that penetration testing is partially the answer to fix the problems that we see in the security industry. I mean, without knowing where your exposures or your risks are at, 
you're not going to be able to protect or defend against them. And that's why we came out with adaptive penetration testing. For us, security breaches are the best thing that could ever happen to a company. I mean, take, take a look at, uh, at Diebold. Uh, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind, we sold these things off in, you know, eight years ago or something like that, and they continue to be in the news. Um, and what that did for us, though, is it really put security into our entire company. I mean, our CEO loves security. He looks at it as an enhancement. I get budget. I get people. I am able to actually protect the organization. I'm able to do what I need to do in order to actually protect the organization. And, and albeit we didn't suffer a significant breach, it hurt us. We, we, ex we experienced significant pain as a company. And a company is generally not going to move on security unless they experience pain. In fact, uh, how we get clients is there's a fear in the media because of recent attacks. And also, we get clients because they've been compromised. So then they go, oh shit, we got to do something about it. And then they hire us to do uh, security assessments or code reviews. Fear is not always the best thing, but at the same time, if you can represent how to actually systematically take down that company, it could be good. So let's, let's investigate a real breach, okay? Company A experiences a breach. Um, security up until that point was extremely difficult to implement. They leverage that breach, you actually communicate it, you can use that to your, your best advantage. Now, in stating that, I mean, obviously, you don't want a breach to occur. But at the same time, it's not the doom and gloom that everybody makes it to be. I mean, if you experience a breach, what company has gone out of business from experiencing, well, minus uh, the CERT company, yeah, and Digistore. Yeah. Those guys, Digistore, those guys were, were screwed from the beginning anyway. But, um, but I mean, I think, I think in the history of breaches, some, some guy at Smoocon did a presentation and did studies on this, and two people have gone out of business because of a breach. The CEO lost their, his job. Yeah, the CEO lost his job, yep. And so, you, if you look at that, I mean, systematically, we're not going to go out of business. You should leverage this for your benefit if you experience a breach. I mean, a, most of our first reactions are tuck it away, make sure nobody knows about it, hide it because I don't want to get fired. I mean, if, if you're doing your security job right and you've been preaching that, you know, your security sucks for the past five years, you should have a pretty good backing to say, listen, I've been telling you guys for five years, this is what we need to do. Let's make this work now because we're screwed. You guys, f you know, feel pain. I can fix it. And option two is a simulated breach, right? Penetration testing. Uh, which one is it? I mean, for us, I mean, uh, maybe it's not as effective as a real breach can be. I mean, maybe it's not as good as a real breach can be because, I mean, they're actually experiencing pain when you do it. But the ability to simulate an attacker, the ability to actually go into a company and exploit them is going to be leaps and bounds beneficial to obviously happening in the news. And that's one of the things we actually enjoy doing is when we take... Uh, penetration, uh, penetration testing jobs, we actually only take the ones that allow us to do full compromise. So the client will give us, you know, what's the target assets? If it's a software development company, the source code, uh, we've done e-commerce companies where it's been their credit cards, and that's the only ones we take because those are the only ones that are interesting. And then one of the other rules that we set for our clients is they can't change anything as the pen test is going on. So if we find some sort of vulnerability that we have to report as part of our contract, we ask that they do not do, they do share that with the IT team so they fix it because then it affects the pen test. But uh, we like to simulate real world type stuff. We don't like to stop at a particular point. So we're very picky on what ones we actually do. And so penetration testing isn't the smash and grab that we're used to. It's not firing off the scanners. It's not running a bunch of exploits trying to barrage the, the infrastructure. Autopone. Hey, <laughs> you know, it does have its absolute purposes for it, but yeah. I mean, it's not the techniques that we're leveraging right now. It's more than finding exploits. It's more than actually going after a system and saying, I got domain admin. I mean, it really has to hit the company where it hurts. And that's the most important part about it. So again, the reason why we wanted to go into this and, and give you a little bit of, of history behind it is because we truly believe that penetration testing is absolutely uh, one of the, the founding things that can help a security program grow. And what we wanted to do is give you a perspective of how you need to look as you're doing these penetration tests and what you need to think of. Come, think outside of the box. Think of something that hasn't been done. I mean, yeah, if you're having low-hanging fruit with SQL injection, that's great, but leverage that for something else. And so the rest of this talk, my next slide. Story time. The rest of this talk is story time. We're just going to go through real-world scenarios that we've done in penetration testing that's unique, something that hasn't been done before, something that, you know, is unique in nature, something that, you know, might not be as crazy sophisticated or it might be but something that was unique that actually provided the value to the customer. So our first demo is company one, which uh, Kevin was doing an assessment on in December of 2010. Yeah, so this company was a company that developed software for the financial markets. 
And uh, again, it was a full compromise. Uh, our goal was to get access to the source code of their products. And what we like to do at our company is we like to actually do a lot of reconnaissance to get their environment, you know, to get exactly a, uh, an idea of their environment so we could set up their environment in our lab. And that way, once we know their environment, we can go ahead and try exploiting our own environment. And then when we're doing it live, especially like with a spear phishing attack, you only usually get one shot, so it works. So we're very meticulous at setting up the exact systems, you know, using also, you know, using VMware, so we have the exact environment. And, you know, how do you, get, like for example, when you're targeting a company and you want to get around the AV, what, it, what do you hear about what typically people do is they'll use social engineering to call up the company, call an employee to find out what AV they're running. I don't do that. I do it more passively is there's only a handful of AV companies, right? So I'll call the AV company pretending to be the client saying, hey, we want to purchase more licenses. Let me talk to sales. And then I'll give my company name and they'll look it up. They'll be happy. They want to make a sale. So that's how I will determine the, uh, who the AV company is that's providing, you know, uh, providing the software. So now, now we have the AV environment. Now we have whether what they're running. We'll use stuff like FOCA. We'll use social engineering. We want to get their environment. So in this particular test, what we had found was most of the users at the company were running Windows 7, which was surprising because most of, at this time, most people are running uh, XP. And, uh, and, to, to, and what we wanted to do was basically target a, an individual that was on the internal network through a spear phishing attack actually using uh, uh, Dave's tool, but we wanted to get persistent access to the company. So what the problem was is we had to get around, at that point the company was using semantic endpoint security, so we created some cryptid, cryptid metaterpreter meta shells so we could, you know, so it wouldn't be detected by AV. And uh, as, we're, as we're setting this up, then we, you know, it was you know, realized because it's Windows 7 that these people were likely running with the defaults meaning that UA UAC was enabled. So started doing some research on bypassing UAC and found that this, I uh, forgot the gentleman's name, do you remember the guy? Andrew something or? No? I don't remember, it was like a uh, prestigious something. Did some research and found that some guy had uh, found a workaround to bypass UAC. And it was like exploiting two vulnerabilities. The first was simply injecting into uh, Explorer because it was running at a medium integrity. And from there, because of the whitelist, you could use it, you could use the i i file operation com object to copy to copy files. So you could pretty much place a DLL or anything in any directory. You could do a file copy operation. So because certain programs also, when you execute them, would look in its current directory for the DLL. Um, excuse me one second. And not system thirty two you can simply use this iFile uh, operation com object to, uh, to uh, create a fake DLL to drop it in the directory. So now when you fire up the executable, it would check in its current directory first before it would check in system 32 because it wasn't in that uh, known DLL list. And basically, you can bypass UAC. So this guy created a pr proof of concept tool that was kind of a GUI based. So I had one of my security engineers create um, basically a command line version, command line tool that worked flawlessly. Then I was talking to Dave, I said, why don't we incorporate this in Metasploit, right? So Dave took it, and I think you had some people at Diebolt, uh, Diebolt uh, working on the same thing, creating a command line version. Then I think on New Year's Day, you released it. So this was actually doing a lot of work prior to doing the attack. So finding out the AV, finding out the operating system of most of the targets of the company, and actually working on bypassing UAC before the client was even hit. And then when we did the attack, it actually worked flawlessly the first time, right? So I put a lot of time into preparation, into information reconnaissance before doing the real attack. And you want to talk about the, the system profiler? Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. So another tool we use is by using, you know, bugs in uh, email and by getting people to click links, um, by using FOCA. Well, well, that wasn't what the profile. Well, we created a JavaScript. A, Drav a JavaScript tool that actually would profile the user. It would find out the version of a Java they're running, the version of uh, Ado the Adobe Acrobat products, uh, the version of uh, QuickTime and Windows Media Player. So basically, had to lure the target to simply a site that ran the JavaScript code. And this is kind of like an example. And again, we would try to fingerprint the user 
prior to doing the attack, so we know what, what exploit would work, right? And that way, again, a lot of times this is, you know, when we're doing attacks, it's a one-time opportunity because we'll target people that are network engineers or system administrators. How do we find them? LinkedIn is very useful. You can put in a company name and put in engineer or put in administrator, and you could likely get a target list. That's one of the tools, you know, LinkedIn, Jigsaw, and uh, pretexting, and so on and so forth. So then we combine that information with fingerprinting the targets, and then we know exactly where to hit them. And it usually uh, has a, a good 99.9% .9 success rate. So at this point, I mean, you know, Kevin at this point had customized uh, interpreter shells that were AV bypassed uh, using encryptor and um, was able to basically um, target Windows 7 fully patched systems and then from there um, try to go in and target uh, the systems itself. And so at that point, I mean, if you want to talk about the actual compromise, and, and, and at this point, I mean, you know, you well, had the ch chance to either pivot or go further. Well, I had a chance I could pivot on, on the user's workstation and not bother bypassing UAC to target stuff on the inside. But instead, I wanted to have persistent access into at least one person's desktop so I can go, you know, keep going back. And um, so I wanted to do something that was quick because I was, you know, spent so much time on the prep part of it and the research and getting everything working in the lab, I just wanted to expedite it. I could have sent an email and waited for somebody to go forward with the email, but instead I used set in this, uh, on, on this occasion uh, with the, uh, you know, the Java applet attack, and then simply call the user pretending to be, calling the target pretending to be somebody on the inside of the company that uh, needed to test on the staging server. And basically just gave him the URL of, um, of where set was running, Java applet pops up, and the guy, and I said, and, they, and you know, they say, well, I got, a, I got this applet popping up. Oh, just click OK, don't worry about it. You know, it's all in staging, it's all in testing and then exploited them immediately. Rather than waiting, you know, so, it was, so again, it was just calling them up, again, a telephone ex uh, social engineering exploit, calling them up on the phone, having them click the Java applet, that way it was done. And we created an automated script. Once they clicked the applet, uploaded the interpreter shell, set something up in scheduled tasks that ran the cryptid interpreter shell every 30 minutes, and that way it was a persistent connection into the target. And so what I'm going to show you here is, is a demonstration of that actual bypass using the social engineer toolkit and the Java applet. Um, what I'm going to show you is, is, is the new version, version 2.1, which has been in development now for probably the past uh, three months. I'll talk a little bit about the new features uh, later on, uh, but there's some wicked stuff coming out. I'm also going to be talking about something that I did, um, which is currently being reviewed by the EFF because I don't want to get sued. Um, so once that's actually okayed and cleared and I got the backing, um, I'll definitely release it, but I'll talk to you about what that is. And so to launch set, you know, command line, and I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it's probably, uh, is that better? And so we have set here, and um, in the new version of set, I've incorporated uh, Fast Track, which is a tool that I came out with a few years ago um, that was really popular around automating of, of penetration testing. I've recoded Fast Track completely from scratch um, using a lot more better programming tactics. Uh, Fast Track was my first Python uh, program, which I don't think I used one comma code in there, and it was just a hodgepodge of code. Um, so since I've actually matured in my age uh, in programming, I've actually commented the code and, and wrote things that are actually multi-threaded and, you know, use the functions and, you know, reuse code and stuff like that, which was relatively unique for me. Um, so that's now incorporating a new version of set. And so we select the social engineering menu, and we're going to go to the website attack vector. We're going to select the Java applet attack method. And for, for me personally, the Java applet attack vector is by far the number one most popular attack that I leverage during, during an attack. Reason being is I no longer really have to attack a browser bug or an Adobe bug or a Flash bug. I mean, when I'm going and exploiting those, you have maybe a small percentage of that actually being successful unless you did a ton of reconnaissance ahead of time. The Java applet attack leverages trust. It's not an exploit. It's not a bug. It's something that leverages trust of how, how Java is actually de designed. And so we're going to go ahead and clone a website. And we're going to do Gmail. And it can be any website you want to. And what Set's going to do is going to go pull that website down, rewrite the web page, set up a fake web server, custom compile a bunch of stuff, do a Java applet, and then so on and so forth. And in 
one of the earlier versions that I released, I think it was 1.7, um, I incorporated what's now called the, the, the set um, interactive shell, which is a completely custom um, interactive shell that's similar to, to what you would expect from Metasploit or Meterpreter, uh, but specifically customized and designed for set. And each time a new payload is deployed, it, it does a randomized cipher key exchange of AES-256. Uh, so you have AES-256 communications going back and forth each time. Um, it randomly compiles it and obfuscates each individual time to get around signature-based detection. Um, and it has a bunch of tools built into it. And so we're going to select that. We're going to listen on port 443. And it's going to do everything for us. And so now we have everything listening here. And I'm just going to grab my IP address. I think it's 129. And so I have UAC on here, if you can see, it's, it's set to its default value. This is a relatively recently patched uh, Windows machine. Comes out every two days, so. So we're gonna go to 129, and it's going to load the Java website for us. And it looks just like Gmail. And, and funny enough, and I'll talk about this right now, but if you see here, you know, say someone's like, oh no, I don't wanna click on this, and I hit cancel, and they go to type it in. Can't type it in, I hit cancel again. Oh, I accidentally hit run. Okay, so then it actually executes it. It's, it's what we call the Java repeater. So it continuously, as soon as you hit cancel, it repops up, cancel, repops up. They can't even type their email. They can't even close the browser unless they kill it through uh, Task Manager. So it's really annoying as hell. And so they're just going to click run regardless because they want to get the thing off of the screen. They have no idea what the hell's going on. <laughs> and so um, you, as soon as they hit run, it redirects the victim back to the legitimate website. So I clone Gmail. As soon as I hit run, it redirects them back to the legitimate site, and everything looks like it's normal. Now, one thing that's kind of cool, and this is what I got, this is what I'm working with the EFF about, uh, which I, hopefully it's okay. This will be cool though. Um, is what happened a long time ago when I released set is uh, you could do what's called self signing of the Java applet. So you can sign it as Microsoft or Google or whatever you wanted to, and so the Java applet would pop up as this is published by Microsoft. Well, after set started getting a lot of uh, mainstream on it, they changed and did a patch to show just a big unknown as the publisher if it's self signed. So you basically have a publisher with a self sign of big unknown. Now we saw from, from statistics, it literally impacted set zero. Um, so we still have a 99% success rate when sending this. Um, but at the same time, it wasn't good enough for me. And so what I did was, I looked at how you actually get a valid certificate uh, from the different variety of, of code signers. And so I registered a uh, company in the state of Ohio. Um, and then I bought a code signing certificate. And the name of that is Verified Publisher. My company is called Oracle Java Applet. <laughs> this is better. It's a C Corp. <laughs> well, you know, Kevin was Kevin was worried about calling up GoDaddy. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's weird when we do pen testing. Like I remember, I was going to participate in the social engineering CTF at DEF CON two years ago, and the, the, they wanted me to target Microsoft. So I registered MicrosoftTest.com, MicrosoftThis.com, and then I got a call from GoDaddy, going, Mr. Mitnick. We realize you, you know, we just found out you registered these Microsoft domains. Is there anything we can do to help you? I go, no, no, everything's fine, thank you. But they actually took it upon themselves to call and check, you know, because maybe I'm on their list. You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to register today? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, and, and, the, and the proof of this, I mean, the, the reason why we wanted to do this is, you know, the way that we do these type of attacks, I mean, it cost me $30 to register uh, an LLC in the state of Ohio. It cost me um, an additional $200 for a code signing certificate. You think an attacker is going to do that if they really want to target an infrastructure or a company? I mean, the, the, the process that you have to do it takes literally about five days. And it's not of hard work. You know, you just submit the paperwork, which kind of sucks. And then you submit it in. It comes back after the governor gets his chance to sign it. And then you go to a website. You fill up some automated forms. You fill some things up. You have to put a fake website. So I got a fake website out there. But um, that's also so even, so even if it's spending a grand, it's, a, it's worth it if you're yeah. doing a real attack. Yeah, it's and, worth and, it. And, and obviously beneficial if you want to actually go and target a company. So it makes it absolutely more believable. And that's the whole point of a pretext or a attack against an organization. You want to make them feel confident in what they're doing. And so couple that with a Java repeater that just annoys the hell out of people and an actual trusted um, applet, people are definitely going to click on it. And so we, go, we went ahead and we clicked on, on run. And over here on our, in our attacker machine, we have a new shell. And the, the set interactive shell is multi-threaded, so you can get 50 um, shells coming at the same time. It, it holds as many as you want to. And here we're going to interact with it by hitting one. And now we're in the set interactive console, which basically gives you access to whatever you need to. So you can hit question mark, and it tells you all the different types of things you can do. So I can drop into a shell, and say I do net user Bob 
and I hugs a lot, <laughs> slash add. If you notice here, I get access is denied, right? And why is that? Because UAC stopped us. User access control prevented us from actually being able to add a local user account onto this. And so what we incorporated in the set was bypass UAC, which you just type bypass UAC, the IP address. <laughs> and this still is not patched, by the way. We released this in December of 2010. Still uh, operational on all, the, uh, all Windows 7 based systems, 64 and 32 bit. So we let it do its thing. This, by the way, took me so long to code. What's scary is there's only, I think, three uh, whitelisted executables that are outside the System 32, yeah. so, uh, so, it's, uh, so Microsoft could easily fix it. Yep. Yeah. And so if you yeah. see here, we get, we get connection received from the uh, victim machine. We drop back out to this, and now you see here on option two, we see Windows colon UAC safe. So now we can drop into that. And we completely successfully bypass Windows UAC. You know what's interesting with your tool is I'll I'll do a you know I'll have a speaking engagement and I'll demonstrate Java applet and I'll leave it run and then I get busy and then I'll fly home and then I'll I'll go there and I'll realize like six or seven people not at the conference connected to the site and actually executed the Java applet just random people on the internet you know it just it, it's they're not happy it, it's it's amazing. <laughs> I should, I should let it run for like a year and see what happens. I don't want the feds knocking on my door, never mind. And, and my, my point isn't to cover all the tools here, but I mean, it has a lot of things like um, list running processes, execute things. You can do SSH reverse tunneling, uh, so you can tunnel a port based on the internal port, reverse it back so you can connect to it locally, so if you want to tunnel RDP or things like that. Um, it's got, you know, kill processes, reboot, local admin, domain admin, uh, grab system, so you elevate your privileges as a system, keystroke uh, uh, logging, keystroke dumping. Um, it also does lock workstations, so you know you can you know um, lock the workstation while you're keystroke logging and intercept their uh, user credentials, which is one of my favorite ones, and um, a lot of different ones like that. But the whole point isn't to go through the set interactive shell, but just to show you the bypass UAC. So lessons learned from this. What do you learn from this at that? From UAC. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, lessons learned if you if you put your mind to it and uh, actually prepare and you're meticulous about it, you're usually going to get in. Yeah, Ke Kevin, by by far, is one of the most meticulous people that I've met. I mean, before he goes into Pentest, you know, for me, I'm kind of like a hack job. So I'm like, oh, this is cool, this will work, you know, and kind of figure out things and I kind of do it. Kevin's like 100 percent, this has to work, you know, or else I failed, um, which you know is obviously a, a pro, something I I have ADD, so I try to do different things at times. But yeah, I, um, think, I think with enough, you know, with the, the upfront preparation. You know, you're, you're, uh, I think it's really critical to be successful in this stuff. You know, or you could just throw stuff at it and hope it works and uh, get detected. You know, and uh, I don't like to be detected. And didn't you do a physical part of this as well? Yeah, that was, that was also a cool one is um, the client also wanted to see if there's other ways to get in besides social engineering somebody with, uh, you know, over the telephone. So uh, my next step was looking up one of the uh, facilities they had in Google Maps and saw it was a pretty big building for this uh, company. And I did a little bit of more uh, research and found out they just rented an office suite. So then I tracked down the Realty Company and I set up an appointment because I, under the pretext, I wanted to rent office space. So I had some business cards printed with uh, the name Pinkerton Investigations, okay? <laughs> and I had a colleague of mine, actually a friend of mine that's uh, in Ghost in the Wires, my friend Alex because he used to do all this uh, physical stuff with me back years ago. He said, Let, you know, come on, let's go down to, you know, d down south to where the company was. We show up, we were in suits, we, ha we have our Pinkerton business cards, and we, you know, ask for the tour of the office space. And then, and then I said, well, listen, you know, we're a security company. He goes, yeah, I've, I worked with Pinkerton before on, uh, on getting them office space when I was in New York. I said, and he asked me if I knew these people. Of course I did, when I never even heard of them before. So I had the credibility. Then I said, well, as a security company, we're really concerned about security controls of this physical building. So I need to know how everything works. So the guy, the reality guy, told me all the security controls that were in place. When the camera, when the, you know, was there live surveillance? No. You know, when the cameras were turned on, how the alarm would work. You know, basically all the security controls uh, that the building had, the perimeter uh, patrol, how often, you know, somebody, a security guard would run around the perimeter that the doors were unlocked during business hours, right? They use hid cards to get in, 
and by eyeballing it when we're walking around, I saw they were, they were using Schlage Everest locks, right? So my goal was to find out the janitorial company, because a lot of these office suites have you know, uh, combined janitorial services that served us the client, because I thought the janitorial crew would be the easiest to convince to let me into the facility, so I wouldn't need a key. So I ended up calling the janitorial service uh, and trying to work out, well, who are the actual people that clean the building? Because I want to talk to them because they're the lowest level, right? And would be, you know, if I could use, like, caller ID spoofing and call from the office, maybe I can convince them, well, if these people show up, go ahead and let them in, right? So I found out who the supervisor was, and then I decided to change tact. I, I, was, I wanted to get home, and I wanted to do this quickly. So I called the supervisor of the janitorial crew, and I said we had a system crash, uh, on our, on, on, on our, in our building, and the access cards won't work for your janitorial crew to come in Sunday morning to clean. But we have a solution. I have a new card. So the whole idea was, was to go drive out to the uh, janitorial crews, uh, to this one lady's house, give her a new hit card that would uh, obviously was, didn't have any credentials on there, and, give, and get her old one so we can get into the building. So as I was setting this up, the supervisor calls me and says, uh, you know, uh, you know, Tony, um, we don't use access cards to get into the suite, only into the building. We actually, and he went on to tell me that on the janitorial door, we have a little lockbox, and in that lockbox is all the master keys to everything in the building. <laughs> right? So I go look, and lo and behold, there's this ace two, there's this lockbox, I jiggle it, I hear the keys, but it's an ACE2 lock and those are the hardest to pick. I called my friend Barry Wells in, the, in the Amsterdam who runs Tool at an L. I said, hey Barry, I got this ACE2 lock. You know, what tool do you suggest? And it was, the, it was a tool sold by Peterson International. So I found these great guys that actually uh, did do some work at DEF CON in the Lockpick Village and said, hey guys, I need you to come out and uh, help pick an ACE2 lock, right? So I set one team on the lock and the other team to actually pick the sweet door because it was like a kind of a trap door. And it, again, it was a, sh a Schlage Everest lock, so it has a security pin in the back. And they actually were able to breach the sweet door before they were able to breach the ACE2 lock. We get into the building or to the suite of the client, and uh, we realized all the administrators had secondary locks on the door, and they put their trash cans outside their door. So even if I got in with the janitorial crew, I would have been stopped at that point. So actually it was, gr uh, it was good luck that I decided to go the lock picking route. So it didn't take long. They picked those locks as well. We got all the way into the server room. And in the server room they had a nice post-it note with the administrator password, which was helpful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on, like none of you have <laughs> never done that before. Uh, I? I took a picture of it and sent it to the CSO. I said, this is a bad idea. But they felt secure because, you know, there were so many locks to go, you know, so many doors to go through. We actually found the access keys, you know, the, the machine that made the access card and, ma and made our own. So we had full con access to the building. Planted a Linksys access point just for the hell of it. Um, and then I went uh, going about to find who the administrators were and basically rebooted their boxes onto a, a USB tool so we could basically, uh, you know, uh, set, set uh, an account to administrator level and set a password. Rebooted their box and then installed encrypted interpreter shells uh, and we just used task scheduler to connect out every 30 minutes. So it, it, it was kind of like, what, what was cool about this attack is without the building management being so helpful and let us, letting us know about the security controls and especially letting us know that the clients do not have alarms. It's just alarm on the main structure. And what we're able to actually do is because of their, uh, how their system worked after they told us their security controls is the back door, we actually were able to duct tape the lock so after we left on the tour, we were able to walk back into the building to do more reconnaissance before the real attack. And so, uh, you know, so this was kind of a cool attack because it was, uh, it was again, you know, going in, physically doing it, doing some lock picking and owning the entire infrastructure that way. And it was extremely successful and they never detected it, right? Um, I think about four, four weeks later, I told, them, I told them, you know, hey, did, you, did anyone report anything suspicious? or anything going on? He goes, no. Well, I said, well, do me a favor. That links this access point in this office. Go ahead and unplug it from the network. And then, then they realized they were hit because I wanted to wait a while 
to see if, it, if the uh, attack would be detected. And it never was. Because I think that's important too, is not only did you get in, but once you get in, did the IT staff or the security staff realize there's been a compromise? So this next one is uh, company two, which is uh, uh, malicious media. And uh, this actually happened, there we go. This actually happened this month. Uh, it was an engagement that I was working on. And it was a Fortune 1000 company, and a uh, customer requested to deploy malicious items through the parking lot. So we've, we've gotten those assessments before, right, where you know, the customer wants us to drop malicious USBs or DVDs um, in the parking lot and see how many people pick it up. Well, we want to do something different because those are getting boring for us. Um, so how many times have you seen an RP that says you must do it this way? Uh, so we were bored with the standard deployments, and so we decided to do something a little bit different. And so I went and scoured the internet for the most expensive, fancy keyboard that I could find. And, um, and who would want this thing? I mean, that thing is awesome. I mean, it's got lights and stuff, and I mean, it's, it is an IT person's wet dream, right? I mean, they can do some major gaming at lunchtime on this thing, right? Little Star Trek communicator. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we did is uh, we sent this keyboard modified, obviously, uh, to five IT folks um, in the actual company itself. And this is where we talk about the Tinsy attack. And the Tinsy attack is this little device right here, and you can't see it, but it's this, this computer chip here. And here's a couple of different ones out there. And I have to give a, a special shout out to, uh, to Josh Kelly because uh, his, his research that he's done on WinFing 98 has been instrumental in a lot of stuff that we're doing here. And he's also got a talk on Sunday uh, where he's gonna be releasing some extremely cool stuff that will literally blow your minds of what you can do with this. Um, so Josh, no pressure. Um, and what we did with this is we, we, we recoded the, the, the keyboard itself to do an inline attack. So essentially when you hit a key on the keyboard, the Tinsy um, detected it and then prop propagated that key out. So we can actually start to detect when someone's actually there, right? And so what happens is um, when it doesn't detect somebody there, it moves the pixel of the mouse up one and to the left. And so you, you don't notice it on the screen, but it keeps the screensaver active. So after about you know, two hours of inactivity, you know that person's not there and you can drop your malicious payload onto it. And why that's important is this thing is recognized as a keyboard. And you can change the vendor ID or product ID to whatever you want to, so you can make it that manufacturer that we bought the keyboard off of and put it in there. And why is that important? Because it disables auto run. There's no auto run capabilities. If you have, if you have auto run disabled, it's still gonna execute because it's recognized as a keyboard. The Tinsy devices have onboard memory storage that emulate keyboard typing, and I'll show you that in a second. And so during off hours, we deployed it. So, so funny story about this, is actually really funny, is we got nine shells. We only sent it to five people. So my only guess is that the IT guys got jealous and ganked it from, from the other person, which is what we normally do in IT, right? I mean, if it's out there, it's cool, we take it. And, and we got nine shells, so their joke's really on them. But uh, so from there, we further penetrated the network and got further access. And I just want to show you a demo of this. And this is all available um, in the Social Engineer Toolkit, uh, in the latest version and, and other. But essentially, you just go to Set, you go to Social Engineering Attacks, you go to the Adreno-based attack vectors, and you select what attack vector you want to do. And it has some of the X10 stuff that we've been doing with jamming, which I'll talk a little bit about. And then uh, my favorite one is deploying a binary via the Tinsy attack. And wh what's cool about this is you can actually drop a binary onto the system and have it convert back and run a binary. So, if my demo works, we should see some, some magic typing happening here. No hands. <laughs> Kevin's, whistling. <laughs> Kevin's whistling. <laughs> and so what's happening here is it's deploying a payload onto the system using a, a hexadecimal representation of it. And so what we're going to leverage is PowerShell to reconvert our hexadecimal representation of our binary back to a binary again. And what this one is, what's cool with this one is I leverage a, a tool called Shellcode Exec, uh, which if you're not familiar with shellcode exec, it's just an executable where you can give it a uh, second argument parameter that's alphanumeric shellcode and it shoots interpreter straight into memory. So it never touches disk. And so in this case, you're gonna see it convert here in a second. We're gonna do our conversion. Come on. Here it goes, it's doing its conversion. This took a long time to code, by the way. My wife hated me on this one. Sorry, Aaron. She's actually here, oops. And so we execute, and lo and behold, I didn't have my listener up, oops. Well, I would have dropped a shell. All right, hang on, one, one second, let me hook it up real quick. So right now it's generating the alphanumeric shellcode. It's gonna stage everything into um, a, a, um, 
hexadecimal representation of it. It's going to create the PD file through Adreno, and this is what it actually looks like over here. So you can see the, uh, the Adreno stuff right here. So this is all the code that's doing. And then, we're going to do this one more time. Sorry. That's what happens when you forget to do I stuff. I remember when we were testing this, and I was testing this on this, uh, what was it, an Acer 1? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, it's too and slow. The, time, the timing on this thing was like crazy. And, it would, uh, and so uh, Dave and I you know, had to spend, what, like a few days with the timing on it because it was just, it was just like funky. It, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, uh, yeah. slower computers ran into the issue that it, it was typing up way too fast yeah. for the actual computer to handle, mm -hmm. and so, um, and usually I have that problem on whenever I'm typing, so um, yeah. can't handle me. But uh, you know, in, in this specific case, we we ended up working it out and getting the timing down right and everything. But uh, you know, essentially, what you can do with this, and what's cool is uh, we did a modification to the Tinsy device, which I don't have one on me right now. Uh, but Josh, Josh ended up soldering a um, SD card onto uh, the Tinsy device, and now you can do native SD storage on, S uh, on the Tinsy device. But why that's important is, when you plug it in, it doesn't recognize as a, um, you know, a, a storage device, because the Tinsy actually natively reads in the SD card. So you can store as large of a binary as you want to on it, and then copy it off. So you're not you know, restricted with the characters that you would have um, leveraging uh, the Tinsy device, because the Tinsy device only has like 128K and 64K based on the model you get. And so if we go back to our attacker machine here, there's the interpreter shell. So, lessons learned from this, we decided to do something a little different and mess around a little bit, and it, we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and so we only have a little bit of time, so you want to fly through this one? This is the, the um, external wireless and penetration test. Oh, yeah. So, um, the company had us do a, a, wire, well, a wireless security assessment, but also was a web app assessment. We, and through SQL injection, we were able to breach the uh, external web servers. And then using a tool, who, who, who wrote that white paper on the tool? We're able to export the uh, private RSA keys. Jason Geffner. Jason Geffner wrote a white paper, and based on this uh, white paper, actually uh, had some uh, code that he released that lets you export the private keys to the certs. So he basically stole the web server cert, and because this company was running, uh, I don't remember the Cisco product off the top of my head. It was one of uh, Cisco's wireless uh, products. Basically, what we r uh, realized is since they had their own CA, they loaded their own CA, uh, they, they loaded their own CERT onto this uh, Cisco device, or actually um, onto the box uh, that was doing the authentication. And uh, we realized that this CERT was signed by the same root CA as the web server CERT. So we basically stole the web server CERT and was able to leverage that with State PD to create a rogue AP uh, to get uh, clients that would connect to the network through CERT CERTs leverage, you know, we're able to leverage that to get them to connect to our rogue AP and then exploit them through a client-side exploit. So it's kind of cool. So you steal something from one location and you leverage it somewhere else, right? And there's no scanning tools on the market that are going to do something like that. It just, you know, takes human, you know, human knowledge. Well, and, if and if I remember correctly, yeah. too, I mean, when you penetrated that, that server, I mean, you ran into a lot of dead ends. I mean, it was really locked down DMZ. I mean, oh, yeah. No was, oh, yeah. That's another reason. It was, you know, we were looking like, okay, we're sitting on the DMZ, you know, we're trying to get to the internal network. Um, basically, everything was blocked. It was taking too much time. So then we had to figure out how, how else can we get to the internal network. Then we thought, well, let's just steal the cert and the private keys, create a rogue, and then have clients associate to it. And it worked. And it was very simple. A um, little bit of debugging, but uh, it, it, was, it was easy. Yeah. Company four, um, this is for power lines. Um, at DEF CON, we re released a, a talk called uh, Pen Testing Over Power Lines, which um, leverages an attack against uh, home automation systems and, and controllers around X10 devices, um, as well as uh, you know, broadband over power lines and stuff like that. And so we're doing a, a physical penetration test against an armed guard facility. And when we started doing reconnaissance over the systems, we basically took pictures of the, uh, the camera systems, um, people entering the, uh, the, the systems itself, and looked at the brand names, and there were X10-based controllers. Um, that they were leveraging for the system. So they're basically using power lines uh, to communicate those devices over um, and start transferring data over on those different routes. And so they were leveraging them over the power lines. And we, what we decided is to be kind of unique on this. And so after researching the brand names, we decided to attack X10-based controllers and see what we can get with it. And so 
we started doing some work, and this is, um, I have to give a shout out to, to Rob Simon because he really was instrumental in, in creating all of this. Uh, and he's also got a talk on Saturday, um, I believe. Is it Saturday or Sunday? Anyways, um, look up Rob Simon. It's on the schedule, um, going over the research that we did on this because it's really phenomenal. Uh, but here's the X10 kit that we we're leveraging with. And uh, Rob basically was, was um, testing the, this device right here, which you can see here I have you know, these lights uh, going on right here. And this is, um, this is the actual device itself. So you can turn it on and off. Uh, with different things, you know, it's home automation, right? Same thing that these security systems were leveraging. And so we decided to create a jammer uh, to, to jam the devices so that if we were going to go into the facility and start attacking it, um, they wouldn't uh, be alerted to any type of alarms or camera systems. Everything would be basically blacked out. And so we started with an Adreno-based device, and uh, we started going a little bit slower, uh, a little bit smaller. And so Rob started mess modifying the, the TW523, uh, um, which is this device right here, basically. Um, so we saw, started soldering it into the home automation device, and we're not any type of electrical engineers in it whatsoever, and so we fried that one tinsy and many more until we finally figured out what we were doing. <laughs> and all in all, we had a product that we ended up uh, fixing, which was this guy right here. And essentially, this device right here is what we call the blackout jammer for X10. And it is a modified tinsy based device, uh, so the tinsy is actually shot into here, and you can program it was based on this. What you should see here is if you're able to go to an external plug on the outside, we even talked about um, uh, creating a light bulb that actually works because you can leverage the power lines off of that. Um, plugging this in and jamming all of the signals through X10 so they wouldn't be able to communicate. And so if you look here, jam, jam the device. So now the X10 is inoperable, not able to work. And in fact, if I start taking, trying to turn this on and see what the hell's going on, nothing, it's dead. Take it off. Pops back on. So nice little test uh, to that. And so what we were able to do, uh, we did a night operation. We disabled the security systems. We lockpicked uh, the, the back entrance door. Uh, no security alarm ever um, triggered. And we had full access to the infrastructure itself. And so we were able from there to, to go in and pillage um, everything we wanted to. And so again, what we wanted to get out of this was to be creative. It hadn't been done before, do something expensive, to be a hacker, right? That's what we're, we're here to do. That's what we're here to design, to think, think outside the box. And so. Instead of giving a customer a 400 page report, we decided to do something unique and have some fun with it. And so I want to go into um, the Social Engineer Toolkit 2.1, which is getting released today. I'll upload it probably tonight when I sometimes maybe don't sleep or whatever. And out of this, I mean, it's 27 new features, 22 bug fixes, 18 enhancements, and usually the bug features um, outweigh the, uh, the bug fixes actually outweigh the features, so I'm actually getting better with coding this time around. So. Just have to say, I'm proud of myself on this one. And so, Fast Track is now a part of it, but one co a couple cool things I want to show you real quick. Oh, God. <laughs> that is not a bug. And I just got to give a shout out to the, uh, the set development team. I mean, it started off with me and um, uh, GR Dupree and. Um, Joe Fur, Joey Fur um, have become on the development team as well as Thomas Worth, and so we actually have a development team working on set uh, quite a bit. And I, it, poor Joey, man, he's he, uh, he, you know, I'll go through and I just stream through code and I do a bunch of stuff, and then he goes through and fixes it. So I got I got to thank him for uh, all of my good good coding techniques that he doesn't like. And so with the Social Engineer Toolkit, one of the coolest options that I think is really cool is we'll go ahead and we'll do the the website attack vector, and then we'll do the Java Apple attack again. We'll go ahead and clone a site, just like normal, like we did last time. And a new option now is option 13, which is shellcode exec alphanumeric shellcode dropper via the Java applet. And why that's important is I rewrote the Java applet to now drop a interpreter stage that shoots directly into memory um, through alphanumeric shellcode and never touches disk. So we no longer have to worry about antivirus anymore. And so the options you have, you have a reverse interpreter, uh, reverse TCP, you have reflective injection, a reverse HTTPS stager, and you also have the, the standard uh, uh, reverse HTTP uh, stager as well. So you can use either one of those. All of them work now. And so it's going to go ahead and generate it for us. We're not going to create another payload to target. And by the way, the, the Java applet targets uh, Linux, OS X, and Windows, so no, no one's safe. Love you guys and the Macs. I know, I love, I love Max. So we go ahead and do the Java applet thing again. 
it loads Gmail. We already know this routine. We don't want to hit cancel because it jacks us up. We hit run. Redirects back, and now we got an interpreter shell. AV, no, 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 no need to worry about AV. That's one of the features. One of the ones that I did a long time ago was um, the MS SQL Brooder, which is one of my favorites. And so, obviously, when you install SQL, you have the capability of having a, a SA password if you use mixed mode or just SQL authentication. And one of um, FastTrack's flagship um, attacks was this type of um, attack where you actually go after um, an actual uh, SQL server. And so this supports side notations, it supports single IPs, but I guarantee if you're going through a large customer, you will always find a blank SA password. So just scan, look for it. So what Seth's gonna do is look for 1433. We're gonna use a default built-in word list. We're gonna use SA, and it found a port open, and it automatically brute forced it. I, I spent a lot of time on tuning performance around multi-threading around brute forcing. I was able to get that through. And you can see on number one, we have 192.168.235.131 with username SA password, password 123. We drop into that. And we can either, either leverage Windows PowerShell or use a Windows uh, debug conversion, which will basically take our binary out. And it looks really cool, too. I'm going to show you. I love this stuff. And so it's going to go ahead and do an interpreter. It's going to encode it, do all that stuff. And now it's going to deploy our initial stager, uh, which is all going through MS SQL at this point in time. And so this is hexadecimal representation of SQL, or of our initial stager payload. And why this is important is um, with Windows debug, you have a 64K restriction. A interpreter shell is going to be a lot larger than that. And so what we did, uh, actually Scott White wrote this a while ago, um, is it will actually take a stager payload that essentially just reads in raw hex and writes out binary. And so we can essentially bypass uh, the 64 -bit, uh, 64K uh, restriction on Windows. And so now it'll go ahead and trigger the payload. And now we got an interpreter shell. This is just one of the many features uh, in the new version of the Social Engineer Toolkit that will be released uh, today. Again, I'm not releasing the, the Oracle, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Java um, code signing one as of yet. Uh, it is definitely there, it's ready to go. Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm doing everything legally when I do it. So. What we really wanted to get out of this talk was, again, just to, to make yourself think creative. You know, think outside the box when you're doing these penetration tests. Do something unique. Do something that hasn't been done before. Do something fun. I mean, you know, the traditional scan and exploit type penetration tests are not doing any type of value. It's not what we were designed to do as a field. Um, so in, in leaving that, I mean, Kevin, do you have anything you want to say? No, I mean, uh, no, I really enjoy doing it. I mean, I, I encourage people to think creatively, uh, creatively be innovative. Um, you know, we do use uh, scanning tools, but that's like kind of initial footprint type stuff. Like I'll use a scanning tool, uh, a very popular one, I'm not gonna mention the name. Uh, it's, it's a company that offers uh, these type of services. And that's really just to do an end map, you know, just so I can run end map using their service and look for anything, like any low hanging fruit, but that's like kind of the very initial stages of a, se a security assessment, very initial stages, and then we go and uh, go on from there. So um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't stop there, and I'm sure a lot of you don't stop at just simple scanning. I'm sure you guys do a lot of more in-depth pen testing, but you never know, you know, because again, I've dealt with clients that showed me past reports, and again, it's like the 400 page report that doesn't have much value that's just repackaged information from a, an automated scanning tool. So uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So you guys, go ahead, yeah. real, real quick, we're, we're running out low on time, so. Kevin, the new famous whistle. The famous uh, whistle? Yeah. Yeah. I, I could do it, well, I, I actually recorded my famous whistle. Well, hold on, I, I actually recorded it. You mean the one to launch the nukes? Because <laughs> today I'm not really good at whistling, but hold on, hold on. Hold on. Bear let's down. See. Let's see if I have it. Because it's funny as hell. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, here we go. I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. There's your famous whistle. Thanks, everybody, for coming to the talk. We appreciate it. Thank you.